Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine Please be seated. An ordination in the Presbyterian Church is a work of the Presbytery, and so I bring you greetings on behalf of Graham Hart, our General Presbyter, and your sister churches from Lely all the way up through Bradenton. And we rejoice with you this day as you celebrate the ministry and call of Terry Joe Crago. The members of the commission are before you this morning, and you can find our names printed in the bulletin. But are there other minister members of the Presbyterian Church or others who are with us today? And I, if so, I please ask you to stand. Can you introduce yourselves, starting with Randy? Devin Andrews, Winter Garden, 
，对。Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you for being with us on this special day for Cherry Joe, and let us worship God together. In the light of Christ, we see the shadows of our world and of our hearts. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. Almighty God. Light of the world, you cause light to shine out of the darkness. You continually open to us the ways we are to prepare. And yet we confess our unwillingness to see the light and to walk in your ways. We have not always opened our eyes to the needs of others. Our feet have wandered from the paths of justice and peace. You call us to be still and know that you are God. Yet we are drawn into the world's hurriedness and impatience. Forgive us when we have slumbered instead of remaining alert, waiting and watching for you. Bring us back to that place when our love was fresh, where our vision was clear, and our feet are willing to follow you to places of Friends, hear the good news. Love has broken into the world of despair. Light has broken into the world of darkness. Life has broken into a world of death. There is no place where love, where light, where life cannot be found. For Christ makes all things new. Go now in peace with hope, joy, and love, knowing you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our first lesson comes to us from Psalm 46. Listen for the word. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, see what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear he burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. Listen for the word of the Lord. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, 
nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to, to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The word of the Lord. Today I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Tending the flock of God. Now as an elder myself and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory to be revealed, I exalt the elders among you to tend to the flock of God. That is in your charge, exercising the oversight and not under comp compulsing but willingly, as God would have you do it, not for the sordid gain, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in dealing with one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that you may exalt, so he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A Catholic church was hosting a community service, and everyone was excited and with great dignity. The priest led his three Protestant colleagues towards the chancel area, when suddenly he realized as he got up there, he noticed that there were not chairs for them to sit down. So he whispered into one of the layperson's ear, and he said, will you please go get some chairs for our guest pastors? It happened to be an elderly gentleman who was a little hard of hearing, so he said, excuse me, could you repeat that, please? The, police, the priest, a little bit louder, said, will you please go and get three chairs for the Protestants? The old man looked a little puzzled on his, and he rose to his feet and he turned to the rest of the congregation and he said in a very loud voice, this seems highly irregular, but I've been asked to have you stand and give three chairs for the Protestants. <laughs> Ordination is an important and a life-changing event. It is to be taken seriously and reverently, but there is also a celebratory side to it as well. As we gather here on this brilliant afternoon during this blessed season of Advent to celebrate the ordination of Terry Jo Crego, as she enters into partnership of ministry with this faithful congregation here at First Port Charlotte, I want you to take a moment to look around you. No, really, I want you to take a look around you. Take a look. Humor me. <laughs> I hope you noticed that there, there are a lot of folks here who have made a very big effort to be here for this important event for Terry Jo. Folks who have played a significant role in her journey of faith Starts off with her mother, Carol, who was sitting here, her brother, Alan, 
Her aunt and uncle from Wisconsin came all the way, Molly and Rich Maxwell, which wasn't easy, and yet they made the trip. Her aunt Ramona from Arizona, who has always been there for her. I understand, and there are people here that knew Terry Jo when she was in Georgia. For those who do not know, Terry Jo worked at a church in Georgia. And then she was part of the Presbytery staff at, I think, is it Cherokee Presbytery? You were at the uh, camp there. There are folks here from Peace River. There are folks from Pine Shores. Robin, her classmate from school, is also here to celebrate her. I've noticed several folks from the neighborhood where Terry Jo lives have made their journey here today. And of course, obviously, there's a mighty presence from the congregation of First Port Charlotte. Now, some of you might be thinking that the calling of Terry Jo was a matter of good luck, good fortune, or a convenient solution. But I do not believe that this covenantal relationship that Terry Jo and First Port Charlotte have entered into just happened by chance, nor was it good luck or good fortune or opportunistic. Our text from the prophet Isaiah addresses a people who are in dire need of comfort. They are a people of great distress, of raging hopelessness, whose present situation and concerns are monumental. Their nation has been broken. They have been disassembled and scattered as leaves blowing randomly in the wind, powerless in controlling their destination and their future. They are at a point that they're about to lose everything, their family, their homes, their very lives. And then, suddenly, then a flicker of light shines and shatters the darkness around them. For Terry Joe and from the youth who are from Pine Shores, I remind you of that very first flashlight in the cave. The prophet Isaiah reminds the folks that Yahweh is Lord, that Yahweh is their God, their Holy One of Israel, their Savior. Contrary to everything that they have experienced, God has not forgotten them. God has not abandoned them. The dark will not overtake them. They are not alone. When you pass through the raging waters and when you walk through those scorching fires, I will be with you, says the Lord. Do not fear, for I created you. I formed you. I called you by name. You are mine. Hope springs forth and the power for promise is declared. The promise of life and wholeness and the assurance that God is with them, always has been and always will be. It's a proclamation that gives life meaning and purpose. It's a reminder that we matter and that we are loved. When you pass through the waters of brokenness and depression and disillusionment, I will be there with you, says the Lord. I will bring you new life and new love and new opportunities. When you walk to the fire of conflict and mistreatment and severe illness, I will be with you, says the Lord. Do not fear, for I created you. I formed you. I called you by name. You are mine. <laughs> we've been laughing because we've really seen Terry Jo, um, what's the right word? At least Bruce and I have, because I, I think the shoe's on a different foot because she's bossing us around this whole day today, which has been kind of interesting. Terry Jo is the one that picked these passages, and I was delighted that she did because this passage is the one that has really resonated. And I believe that there are powerful words of assurance to remind us, remind her, remind you, remind faith communities of our special relationship with God and our responsibility as children of God. You see, I formed you, I called you by name, you are mine, is a summons by God to live in accordance with God's purposes it's our vocation, if you will. 
It's God's plan and purpose for our lives. It is what defines us at our very core. However, it seems to me that many have forgotten or perhaps never even acknowledged or embraced their vocation. This sense of call, this summons by Almighty God. Do not fear, for I created you. That's a plural you. I formed you. I called you by name. You are mine. I love this notion of vocation, of call, for it is much richer and deeper than a mere notion of a job. Vocation is about listening and then doing what we've been called to do, or as one of my favorite um, commentary uh, writers, woman of faith, Barbara Brown Taylor, puts it, in religious lingo, it means participating in the work of God who created us, participating in the work of God who formed us, participating in the work of God who calls us by name, participating in the work of God who claims us. It is not in isolation that we are to do this, but together as the community to faith. It is together, when we are together, that we are at our best. Together we are able to listen to God's leading and God's calling. Together we are able to discern our vocation and to lift up our gifts. Together we are able to boldly witness and authentically work towards restoration and reconciliation. Together we stand united against bigotry of any and all kind. Together we care for the poor, the widow, the disenfranchised, the hungry, the abused, the outcast, the alien, for God's creation. It is together that we dare to share a vision. It is together that we dare to dream dreams. And my friends, it is together that we work in service to Almighty God. Together, we love one another. Together, we care for each other. Together, we will hold the other person up. For I will be with you, says the Lord, guiding you, sustaining you, leading you. Do not fear. Don't be afraid. For I created you. I formed you. I called you by name. You are mine. Terry Joe, God has had his fingerprint on you. God has called you by name. Your journey wasn't by accident. Your journey led you to this place and this time, to this wonderful congregation. May you have many, many, many years of ministry, of loving one another, of being the church that shines the light, that's the one that lights that first flashlight in the cave, that allows the others then to shine forth. God's richest blessing on you and on this congregation on God's people, for I formed you, I called you by name, you are mine. Amen. In life and in death we belong to God, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing.
to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives. You may be seated. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, you have given each of us gifts to use as members of the body of Christ. With thanksgiving, we bring these our gifts. We pray that they may help as needed our seminary students as they prepare to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to our world today and in the future. On this third Sunday, fourth Sunday of the anticipation of the gift of your son, bless our gifts which we offer in Christ's name and inspired by your Holy Spirit. Amen. We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by our baptism. We are all marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling. We are called to be disciples and called to be servants of Christ, who is our Lord. Yet some are called to particular service and to particular orders of ordained ministry as ruling elders, as teaching elders, and as deacons. And we recognize the importance of each of these offices to which the church ordains men and women in order to assure the fulfillment of the primary responsibilities of preaching the word and administering the sacraments, of ordering the governance of the church, and providing for ministries of care and compassion to the world. Today, we gather to ordain Terry Joe as a teaching elder. Terry Joe, can I ask you please to come forward and face the congregation? These are the constitutional questions of the church. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as Savior? Acknowledge him. <laughs> Good thing this isn't a wedding. <laughs> Acknowledge him as Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the New and Old Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness of Jesus Christ in the church universal, and God's word to you, do you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith, as expressed by the confessions of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and to do, and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead these people of God? Do you and will you? I do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and God's spirit? Will you? And will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to love your neighbors, and to work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, the unity, and the purity of the church? Do you? And will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, will you? Will you be a faithful teaching elder? Proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching people and caring for them. And will you be active in government and discipline, serving all the councils of the church 
And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will with God's help. I would like to invite um, teaching elders, ruling elders, and deacons to come for the laying on of hands. Back there. Go on over. Can kneel. Yeah. Yeah, probably there. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your spirit upon your servant, Terry Joe, whom you called by baptism as your own. Grant her the same mind that was in Christ Jesus and give her a spirit of truthfulness to rightly proclaim your word in Christ from pulpit, table, and font and in the words and the actions of her daily living. Give her the gifts of your Holy Spirit to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people, to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for her work of ministry, give to your servant and to all who serve along with her as elders and deacons among your people, gladness and strength and discipline and hope, humility, courage, a sense of your presence and much humor. Bless, we pray, this new call, O God. And grant Terry Joe and First Presbyterian Church of Port Charlotte your spirit as they work together to seek the mind of Christ and to do Christ's mission and ministry together, both within these walls and beyond. And Lord, give to her a sense of joy. Give to her fruitfulness in her ministry, faithfulness to these people, to you, and to herself. And bless her, we pray, O God. In the name of the three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, We can congratulate Terry Jo as we return to our respective places. You just have to stay for one more minute. Stay right there. You can hug first, but you can just stay right there. <laughs> John, good to see you. <laughs> One more hug. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, there's no way I'm getting that. Thank you. Terry Joe, you are now a teaching elder in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. What a joy it is to participate in this service of ordination this day. 
When Terry Joe asked mm -hmm. if I would present the charge to the pastor for this service, mm -hmm. I was extremely honored. Terry Joe and I have been friends since 1999, when she served on the staff of Cherokee Presbytery and I was serving on the church staff in Cartersville, Georgia, the city where the Presbytery office was located. As I watched Terry Jo work, I was impressed with her intelligence, her creativity, her educational credentials, two master's degrees, one from the Presbyterian School of Christian Education in Richmond and a master's in counseling from the University of Georgia. But most of all, I was impressed with her heart. Terry Jo's love for God and God's people was evident in everything she did. And everyone loved her, which I'm sure does not surprise you. Everyone from the children and teenagers who came to the camps she directed, to the church leaders and Sunday school teachers she trained and equipped, to the older adults she worked with as she guided the Presbytery's older adult ministry committee. Over the years, Terry Joe and I have remained friends as God's call took her to Colorado and Sarasota while I went to Southeast Georgia. And now, since being called to Community Church in Inglewood a year and a half ago, it has been my delight to be in close proximity again. And today, what an honor and joy it is to be here for this special moment in the life of Terry Jo and the life of this church. Terry Jo, in your journey of ministry, you have been faithful to God's call to you. For many years, you have used your gifts for the good of God's church and God's people in non-ordained positions, but you have ministered nonetheless in ways that were beautiful and meaningful and life-changing, and we give thanks for that. And now God is doing a new thing in you. Sensing God's call to serve in a different way, you have completed a Master of Divinity degree successfully completed the standard or ordination examinations, fulfilled all the requirements in the Book of Order, and you have received a call from this good congregation. And now the time God has been preparing you for is here, and we have joyfully witnessed your ordination as a teaching elder, a minister of word and sacrament. So I would charge you to faithfully exercise the vows you have just taken, relying on the grace of God in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Book of Order says, Teaching elders shall in all things be committed to teaching the faith and equipping the saints for ministry. When they serve as preachers and teachers of the word, they shall preach and teach the faith of the church so that the people are shaped by the pattern of the gospel and strengthened for witness and service. When they serve at font and table, they shall interpret the mysteries of grace and lift the people's vision toward the hope of God's new creation. When they serve as pastors, they shall support the people in the disciplines of the faith amidst the struggles of daily life. Lofty and inspiring goals. These words create a beautiful vision of the high calling of pastoral ministry. And yet we know, we all know the reality of ministry is sometimes less lofty. The arguments over the color of the paint in the restrooms, the complaints because the last person who used the church kitchen did not put the utensils back in the right drawer. The email you receive right before worship, criticizing something you have done. These things can take a toll on the pastor. And then there is the reality, the reality of pastoral ministry that in one day you might go from rejoicing with a church member who drops in to share pictures of her new grandchild, to trying to focus on finishing your newsletter article, to rush into the hospital after a church member is taken to the ER, to returning to church to moderate a session meeting that requires all your concentration and administrative ability. How, in the midst of all the realities of ministry, do you faithfully fulfill your ordination vows? 
How do you find the energy, intelligence, imagination, and love that you need? Of all the vows you have just taken, I would call your attention back to the very first vow. <coughs> do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When I lead officer training, I always ask the new officers why they think that vow is included with all the others. It sounds pretty basic, doesn't it? It's very similar to what we ask of those who wish to join the church, trusting in Jesus Christ. Why would those being ordained be asked something so simple, so obvious? This vow, I believe, is crucial to all that we do in ministry. It is first because it is foundational. It is the rock upon which everything else is built. And I think it is a vow, it is a promise we make, because God knows if we did not make this promise, it would be very easy to neglect our own relationship with God. The demands of ministry can seem overwhelming, all-consuming. It is all too easy to rush from one responsibility to the next without pause to be pulled from one need to another, from one crisis to another, so you feel weary and stretched thin. Remember this vow and put it first. Your own relationship with God, your own time for God, your own spiritual health are crucial. Not only is it the key to finding joy and fulfillment in your work, it is also the key that allows you to do your best for God and for the church. When I was in my first ordained call in Virginia, an older minister with many years of experience told me, when I was a young pastor, I thought my job was to be available to people for the sake of of God. Now that I've been in ministry for 30 years, he said, I know that I need to be available to God for the sake of people. Let me say that again. I thought my job was to be available to people for the sake of God. Now I know I need to be available to God for the sake of people. That is an important lesson to learn. You will need to take time for yourself, time to rest, to pray, to laugh, to have fun, to have fellowship. Take your days off, Friday and Saturday or whatever days you choose, and make sure the church understands how important that is. Set healthy boundaries for yourself. Technology is wonderful, but one of the insidious things about it is that it allows work to creep into every moment of your life. I try not to check my work email on my day off because when I do, I end up spending hours working and being burdened by the cares that the email messages bring. Take your vacation time. Even if you are not going away on vacation, entrust the pastoral care responsibility to deacons or others with gifts for pastoral care so that you really have vacation. Take your continuing education time so you can be refilled and renewed for service. Our friend Ted Smith, your former pastor and my former head of staff, when I was associate pastor working with him, once gave me some very good advice that I will pass on to you. Remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Pace yourself so that you can go the distance. Structure your work days so that you set aside time for the necessary disciplines of prayer and study. Another, another one of our old friends, Dr. Jim Schumach, who is the General Presbyter of Cherokee Presbytery, once told me, you can't be available to everyone all the time, every minute. 
in order for you to be available to all the people on Sunday mornings in worship leadership and preaching, there are times during the week when you must be unavailable so that you can do the prayerful, thoughtful, intense work of sermon study, writing, and preparation. Good advice. You might think of it like this. Put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you try to help others. If you pass out from lack of spiritual oxygen, you won't be any good to anyone. You must have the Holy Spirit breathing life into you, filling you and sustaining you for ministry. None of us on our own has within us the resources we need, but with Christ who strengthens us, all things are possible. The other part of this first ordination vow that I would call your attention to is to acknowledge him, Lord of all, and head of the church. It is a daily relief to me to know that I am not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and we trust that he gives the church all that it needs for its life and mission. Trust in him, and trust also in what he provides. Not only do you have Christ with you, you have the church. You as the pastor will be the leader and the shepherd, but you do not carry the weight alone. The session of which you are a member is the governing body. They share responsibility with you. You also have the larger church beyond this congregation. The Pine Shores Church is partnering with you in this church to offer resources and support. And there also is this wonderful body that is Peace River Presbytery that helps all of us fulfill our call. The Presbytery, through both its official structures and through its informal collegiality, is a precious resource that I would urge you to use. Terry Jo, God has blessed you with many, many gifts, and you are using them and accepting this call to ordination and the call to this particular church. God is with you and we are with you, your sisters and brothers who make up the body of Christ in this place and beyond. May God bless you with joy as you love and follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, in your life and in your call. Amen. Fifty-five years ago in October, this congregation met as an officially organized church. Some of you in the pews probably had family members as part of that time. Twenty years ago, your congregation engaged in a massive stained glass project. And that's going to serve as my theme for the charge to the congregation. Just as the stained glass project was completed by some who traced, some who cut pattern pieces, some cut glass, probably cut their fingers too, some fitted came, some installed, and some cleaned, all to bring glory to this worship center. So too, each of you will need to bring your talents and gifts of singing and cooking, teaching and learning, visiting the homebound and welcoming the newcomers, collecting food and sharing fellowship, painting and cleaning, worshiping and telling the story of Christ's love. Eighteen stained glass windows 
were completed in 27 months. Think about what you can accomplish in the next 27 months or 55 years if you are quick to say yes when called upon to do God's work. From Hebrews 13, verses 20 to 21, we learn that the God of peace will equip you with everything good for doing his will, and he will work in us what is pleasing to him. He will equip you through others, and others will be equipped through you. Now back to those stained glass windows. Making them, probably a few pieces of glass were broken. That happens. Terry Joe was probably going to break a few things around here, too. All pastors do. All people do. So she's like every one of us. Be large-hearted, forgiving, loving, and encouraging along the way. Often that broken glass can be used elsewhere in a pattern, or perhaps on another project that isn't even thought about yet. Your website says thousands of volunteer hours in making the windows serve as a reminder for generations to come that with God all things are possible. May the times that you say yes and the hours that you work to build God's kingdom send a strong and clear beacon of hope and love into this community so that it shines as brightly as this glass on the sunniest of days. And each time you enter this worship center, may the glass images remind you of your particular role in proclaiming the gospel. May God be with you. So I'm going to invite uh, Terry Joe to come up, and as well, Kathy Hardy and Carol Crigo to come up, and um, we're going to uh, place Terry Joe's stole around her. And some I know there's a there's a variety of um, stories about how the stole got started. I'm just going to make one up because I speak in parables. But yes, about the 8th century, uh, the stoles were, and we're, just get comfortable because I'm going to go through like 10 years at a time. So about the 8th century, the, they began to put stoles on the clergy for a couple of reasons. One, to distinguish them, distinguishable people. The other is a symbol of uh, obedience. Uh, we have evolved into also recognizing that the stole is also a symbol of service. It is uh, the towel that washes people's feet or dries people's tears. And so we place the, the stole on Terry Joe as a symbol of her ordination as her symbol of obedience and a statement of her service. There is a story behind the stole and I'll encourage you to ask Terry Jo what it means um, because it starts with water and now the, this is what I heard, I have my own story. It starts with the water of baptism and flows into the, fulling, the full calling of the Holy Spirit at this moment and in this time. 
I think it starts with water because I've made her cry so many times. And it kind of just, it went into the Holy Spirit and she's now flying away. Um, but there is a story and I just encourage you to ask her about the story. Uh, her dear friend Kathy uh, sewed it for her. And it's just a nice moment to be able to put the stole of service, put the stole of obedience on her here and now. So God's richest blessing to you. Wear it and listen to what Dawn said, though. me.